Hello, welcome to our daily prayer on today, Friday, July 31. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen. A prayer for grace from W.E.B. Du Bois. Give us grace, O God, to dare to do the deed which we well know cries to be done. Let us not hesitate because of ease or the pe words of people's mouths or our own lives. Mighty causes are calling us. The freeing of women, the training of children, the putting down of hate and murder and poverty, all these and more. But they call with voices that mean work and sacrifice and death. Mercifully grant us, O God, the spirit of Esther, that we say, I will go unto the king, and if I perish, I perish. Amen. One of the options for our first reading this coming Sunday comes from the book of Genesis, chapter 32. It continues the story of Jacob, who as a young man cheated his brother Esau out of what was rightfully Esau's. And Esau was so angry he wanted to kill his brother Jacob. So Jacob had to flee to a faraway place where after many, many years, he worked hard, he got married, he had a lot of children, he earned lots of wealth, and finally decided it was time to return home. So he began to come home with all his possessions and his large family. And as he got close to home, he heard news that uh, Esau had learned that Jacob was returning, and Esau was coming to meet him with a group of armed men. And so we pick up the story the night before Jacob is to meet his brother Esau. This from Eugene Peterson's paraphrase, The Message. But during the night, Jacob got up and took his whole family and crossed the ford of the river Jabbok. He got them safely across the brook with all of his possessions. But Jacob stayed behind by himself. And a man wrestled with him until daybreak. When the man saw that he couldn't get the best of Jacob as they wrestled, he deliberately threw Jacob's hip out of joint. The man said, let me go, it's daybreak. Jacob said, I'm not letting you go till you bless me. This is one of my favorite stories from Hebrew scripture. Jacob comes to understand that this man he wrestled with was in some sense an angel of the Lord or perhaps even God's own self ambushing him there at the river, just as he's in this moment of, of fear and this moment of uh, being disconcerted about what lies before him. The one who is his family may have violent intentions toward him and, and perhaps for good reason. And this sense that this is something of what our relationship with God is about. It's not always just God giving orders and us following them neatly and obediently. Sometimes it's a matter of wrestling with God, of struggling with God, of not understanding, of, of feeling like God, instead of just answering our questions, invites us into a struggle. And in the midst of that struggle come at least two things. Jacob's hip is put out of joint. Jacob, Jacob is marked ever after, changed and transformed by the struggle, and also receives a blessing in the midst of the struggle. It's not only about being mighty, it is also about being vulnerable, both Jacob and the one he is wrestling. And with that in mind, I invite you again to enter with an open mind and heart and spirit to another clip of an interview with Joel Gozer, where he touches on some of these themes. I invite you to listen, not so much to agree or disagree, but to learn and to understand and comprehend with compassion. What, what is the, I mean, you think that the white church is missing out on something and there, there, there must be some yeah. kind of opiate uh, mm -hmm. thing that they use for the status quo, right? I'm assuming that's what you're saying. Well, you know, I mean, I think that we all, uh, depending on where we're at, we can easily be um, 
pleasing the status quo, particularly when we don't know what we're missing. Um, and if what we are missing is truly knowing God's children, this God who says that he is a father, and yet we don't, and who says his father is part and as the intimate part of his identity, and yet we don't take time to know the children that are different than us, then you've missed the beauty of God's family. And not only have you missed the beauty of God's family, you begin seeing God in a way that he may not be. If we know what we know about God is predominantly as father, and we know fathers through their children, what becomes, uh, what becomes clear is, is that within segregated spaces, we create a racialized God. Um, and so when you see Michelangelo's uh, painting within the Sistine Chapel, right, with, it, with God as, as this powerful white man, that becomes very formative, not only in our mental image, but in what we think of God's character. Um, but it's impossible to have that conception of God within a prophetic black church context. You know, within a prophetic black church context, you have this vulnerability of God that becomes coming through because what God begins looking like is much more like the people who are fighting for their children within those contexts. You know, those people who love and give their life for their children. Um, and I think an image of God emerges that is in much more keeping with how God is painted in Scripture than with the God that we have formed within the white church. So many times, you know, when, when you have kids that go to an optometrist, they go to an optometrist not knowing that how they're seeing the world is messed up. And it is only through the optometrist's ability to clarify what they could see that they begin becoming dissatisfied with what they saw before. Um, when we look at, for instance, the beauty of the African-American spirituals, um, the African-American spirituals display a certain type of intimacy with God that can often be lost without knowing God through the suffering of the African American tradition, um, which provides a very profound insight into God's heart and God's character that we desperately need. Um, when it becomes hard sometimes going to church when we don't have all of our stuff together, you know, when, this, when we have our doubts, when we have our life wrecked. Um, and there's just, just this vulnerability and there's this intimacy within the prophetic black church that had a God that was perfectly in harmony with scripture and that was very intimate with this brokenness of the human condition uh, and to realize what love looks like within these broken places and where God is, um, I think is something that I desperately needed. And I believe that people who are in similar shoes that I am um, and walk similar paths to what, what I walked, uh, I think that it provides a very powerful antidote to some of the lies that we provide from the white church. Just lies of telemarketers for <laughs> uh, Your uh, your church, your guy may be intimate, but his mind is a winner. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, that becomes, you know, one of the things that really becomes interesting to me is choosing to worship a God that wasn't the winner. Um, and you know we had the you know when Paul is writing yeah, victory in that room. Yeah, yeah. When Paul is uh, writing about how the how the Gentiles have been engrafted, um, what becomes interesting is that for a Gentile to become a Christian, he had to begin worshiping the God who lost. Uh, and what I mean specifically by that is that everybody knew that the Jews' God lost. And when Paul starts preaching that, no, the Jews God won, and he won through Jesus, uh, you have to be, Gentiles have to start worshiping the God that they believed that they had already conquered. Um, and in our own context, um, 
the powerful God has always seemed to be on the white church's side. And it seemed that maybe MLK missed the boat uh, about what this God was about, um, particularly the more radical that King became. Um, and until, uh, I think until the white church begins to be ready to worship the God on the losing side of history, that they're not going to be worshiping the God that had the power of resurrection in Jesus Christ. So what do you think? Could we benefit from God, the optometrist, who clarifies our vision so that we see more clearly than we do now? We see a, a fuller picture of who God is, God who is vulnerable, the God who lost, worshiping the God who lost, or at least who won by losing. That's, that's the God that we meet in the story of Jacob wrestling at the river. God does not prevail. God is not mighty. God does not just trounce Jacob there. God, in some sense, fails to prevail over Jacob. It is a God who meets Jacob with vulnerability, and certainly in Jesus Christ, we meet God who is vulnerable, who knows what it is to be human, to be hungry, to be exhausted, to be worn out, to be frustrated, to be in pain, to be crucified and resurrected. The God who loses, the God who wins through losing, the God who identifies with losers and those who are lost and those who are last and least, the God who knows what it is and is among those who are despised. That also is the God of Scripture, not merely the God who is mighty and powerful and on high, but the God who is vulnerable and weak and burdened and among those who are weak and despised. What a gift to us from Scripture to know that that also is God. And as we open ourselves to the God who is among those who are vulnerable, then perhaps our vision is clearer to see the vulnerable with whom God is and to recognize that they, like we, are children of God and that we together can be a more fuller picture of the community of God, the reign of God here on earth, here in this world, the world such as Langston Hughes prays for. I dream a world where no one, any other one, will scorn, where love will bless the earth and peace its paths adorn. I dream a world where all will know sweet freedom's way, where greed no longer saps the soul, nor avarice blights our day. A world I dream where black or white, whatever race you be, will share the bounties of the earth, and everyone is free, where wretchedness will hang its head, and joy, like a pearl, attend the needs of all humankind. Of such I dream, my world. Joel Goza mentioned the gift of African-American spirituals, and here are the lyrics to a familiar one. Guide my feet while I run this race, for I don't want to run this race in vain. Hold my hand while I run my race, for I don't want to run this race in vain. Stand by me while I run this race, for I don't want to run this race in vain. I'm your child while I run this race, for I don't want to run this race in vain. Search my heart while I run this race, for I don't want to run this race in vain. A Blessing, translated by Lakota Sioux Chief Yellowlark. O oh, great spirit, whose voice I hear in the winds and whose breath gives life to all the world, hear me, I am small and weak. I need your strength and wisdom. Let me walk in beauty and make my eyes ever behold the red and purple sunset. Make my hands respect the things you have made and my ears sharp to hear your voice. Make me wise so that I may understand the things you have taught my people let me learn the lessons you have hidden in every leaf and rock. I seek strength, not to be greater than any other, but to fight my greatest enemy, myself. 
Make me always ready to come to you with clean hands and straight eyes. So when life fades as the fading sunset, my spirit may come to you without shame. Amen. Go in peace. Do justice, love, kindness, and walk humbly with our God. Amen.